Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the 2014 LALIVE lecture organized jointly by the law firm LALIVE and Partners and by the International Law Department of the Graduate Institute. And since I see many partners from LALIVE in the audience, can I just briefly uh, take a second to thank them all. Uh, we at the Graduate Institute are very pleased at this joint venture. And I think that both parties can take pride in what we have accomplished together in the past few years. And also the impressive uh, lineup of eminent colleagues that have been able to put together in this lecture series. This evening, speaker Gary Bourne fits perfectly well into this tradition of excellence of the LALIVE lectures, and my colleague Michael Schneider from LALIVE will present him shortly. But if you can bear with me just uh, a little bit longer, I would just like to say a few words by way of welcome to stress the novelty, not so much of the LALIVE lectures, which uh, are at their eighth edition, but of the venue. This is the first time that we organize the uh, LALIVE lecture in the Ivan Pictet Auditorium at the Graded Institute. It's a great location, and we are very fortunate to have it, and we are happy to share it with you at this occasion. Sadly, Pierre LALIVE is not with us for the first time in all these years. I trust he would have liked this immensely, and our thoughts go out to him tonight. Now, the organization of such events would not be possible if people didn't put a lot of time and energy in it. And I know I'm not doing justice to all the people who were involved in this, but may I just extend my gratitude to Emma Cranfield from the Graded Institute and Anna Nogales from LALIVE for having helped uh, organizing uh, this event. Thank you very much, both of you. Now, all introductions these days need to be pathetically anecdotal, and let this one be no exception, as I would not wish to feel inadequate for the occasion. The first anecdote um, is that as a student at Harvard Law School, I prepared my exam for the international civil litigation in US courts taught by the late Professor Abram Chase on Gary Bourne's casebook. I think it was the second edition. This text exerted a great influence on developing my interest in some aspects of the international law of jurisdiction and jurisdictional immunities. And I trust it played an important role in steering my career and research interests uh, in the direction they both took in those years. Second, I spent with Gary Bourne a couple of days in the same room in Dresden in 1993 to be there together with a handful of other colleagues in the field of jurisdictional immunity, uh, jurisdiction and national territoriality, I think that was it. And we were there at the invitation of Carl Messon um, and uh, the initiative, it was a closed door seminar which led to the publication of the book Extraterritoriality in Theory and Practice. There, too, I received a fundamental stimulus to carry on my research and to finish my first book. So I'm therefore grateful to you, Gary, for this. Whether the profession should be grateful to you for this is quite another matter, but uh, not one to be discussed. Um, be that as it may, I wish to extend to Gary Bone, also on behalf of the International Law Department of the Graded Institute, our heartfelt thanks for having accepted this invitation, and without any further ado, I'll hand this over to Michael Schneider from Lali. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Those of you who watch Arbitration TV uh, are well familiar uh, with Gary Bourne. Uh, one of his uh, best known appearances was recently at The Hague at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And uh, when you visit uh, the site of the PCA, uh, you see the hearing in this uh, very uh, extraordinary case uh, in about the Abbaye uh, enclave and you will see uh, Gary Bourne at work and a link to the institute is that the chairman of that tribunal uh, was Professor Pierre-Marie Dupuis who until recently uh, was a professor here. 
So uh, you, tonight you need not go to the computer. Uh, you see, you will see Gary Bourne uh, in presence, and the Abeye case is just one of the many activities uh, which he has. And the Lalive lecture, as uh, Professor Bianchi uh, pointed out, organized jointly by uh, the Institute and the Lalive firm, has as its objective uh, the, to throw light on the relationship, the interface uh, between public and private law, between commercial and public uh, transactions, between academics and practitioners, and uh, we are quite uh, we are very appreciative of the very good cooperation uh, which our firm has with the Institute, and we are particularly grateful uh, for this uh, very constructive cooperation with Professor Bianchi. Thank you uh, very much. Now, these objectives of the Lalib lecture are uniquely met uh, by uh, Gary Bourne, and he's uh, extraordinarily qualified precisely at uh, these different uh, elements that come together in the objective of these lectures. He's qualified as a US lawyer, but he practices in London and in Berlin, but his cases, as you know, are all over the world. Uh, he practices as counsel in international arbitration, uh, in particular in his function as the chair of the arbitration group of Wilmer, Cutler, Pickering, and Hale and Dorr, uh, and a great variety of cases and a great variety of nature of cases in interstate arbitration, like for instance the case between Eritrea and Yemen about territorial and maritime borders, in investor state disputes, uh, but even something extraordinary in uh, arbitrations between state and NGOs, because he was involved in the uh, Rainbow Warrior case, uh, a very unusual uh, event uh, in commercial disputes in many areas, and I just quote the energy, natural resources, software, joint venture. There's also a case about Swiss watches uh, and telecommunication telecommunications. Uh, Matthias Scherer uh, and I can testify to the remarkable efficiency and persuasiveness of Gary Bourne as counsel, since we had the privilege of jointly representing a European telecommunic company uh, jointly uh, with him. He also acts, acts as arbitrator in a similarly wide range of disputes, and uh, on repeated occasions he was now uh, uh, listen to these titles, Advocate of the Year, Star Performer, The World's Best Litigator, and the work he had in these different functions included a, an important branch of pro bono work. I think that also must be pointed out and is part of uh, the personality uh, of Gary. In fact, in, nine, in 2010, uh, he was named as the leader of the pro bono team of the work. The practice area, as I've just described it, of Gary Bourne is only part of the uh, activities. He sat on the Executive Council of the American Society for International Law and held similar positions on, uh, in many other uh, learned bodies. And he is a prolific writer. We've heard already uh, from uh, Professor Bianchi uh, about one of his books. And uh, let me close by uh, a reference to, with three quotations to, about his, probably his most outstanding book, the book on international commercial arbitration, which now is in, his, in its second edition, and which has grown to three volumes. Now, the quotations, the first one is a professor of Harvard, Professor Goldsmith. This is an unparalleled book on the law, practice, and theory of international commercial arbitration. It explains every aspect of international arbitration with both impressive doctrinal detail and exceptional theoretical accuracy, and will be indispensable for both practitioner and academics. Uh, to uh, strike the balance after a Harvard professor, Professor Huang Ko from Yale, stunningly comprehensive, accessible, and bristling with insights, the definite text on international arbitration. And as the last quotation from Campbell McLaughlin from uh, New Zealand, uh, Bourne proceeds in the way in which the greatest legal scholars have always done. And then uh, McLaughlin adds in brackets, 
and which the modern legal academy often neglects at its peril. I think that doesn't go for the institute. Uh, by, by drawing together the apparently disparate responses of arbitrators and national courts on the central issues of arbitration into a sustained treatise, which expounds the common principles of law, this achievement is all the more remarkable since it has been written by a lawyer and arbitrator with a distinguished and full-time practice. The result is that the book will become the first place to go for practitioners, arbitrators and scholars in their research into issues of general application in international arbitration law. In delivering to us this monumental work of legal scholarship, Gary Bourne has himself contributed in no small measure to such a process. He has equipped us with the fruits of his experience and research in a text which laws claim, like no others, to become the terminus a quo, the terminus a quo on the law of international commercial arbitration in the 21st century. Voila, Gary Bourne. Thank you, that was very, very sweet. <laughs> so after those various introductions, I think I'd rather just go home. Um, I don't think I can improve on where I currently stand. Um, I'd like to thank, firstly, though, both um, the Graduate Institute and uh, the LEAVE, um, Michael, Matthias, and all your partners for this extremely kind invitation. Uh, the Graduate Institute, of course, um, has not just a tremendous brand, um, uh, but also a tremendous reputation. And being invited to, to speak here tonight is, is truly a privilege, and, and I thank you for that. I'd also equally like to, to thank um, Lalive. Um, it is um, a tremendous practice, a tremendous law firm. Um, and it's a real honor as well for me to, to be asked to, to come tonight. And thank you all, of course, for, um, <clears throat> as the English would say, having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be able to spend some time with you. I promise not three volumes of, of time, um, but some time this evening and hopefully on a topic that all of us, um, myself and, and all of you, will, will find provocative, if at the end of my talk, perhaps not in the middle, since I have a PowerPoint that's designed to deter questions um, along the way, um, but perhaps at the end, if there are questions, please, please don't hesitate to, to ask them. I think that's the format of the Lalive lectures and um, something the professor, the late professor, would um, both have um, wanted and no doubt insisted upon. Um, today's talk, um, as you can see, is titled A New Generation of International Adjudication. And in picking this talk, I aimed at um, addressing this intersection that, that Michael referred to between public and, and private international law, and to some extent reflecting my own background, practice and, and theory. Um, and I wanted to explore um, the developments in international adjudication, international dispute resolution over the last century. And I'll be focusing in particular on a new generation of dispute resolution, international dispute resolution, which looks more at the, the last 40 years than the preceding 60 years. And so in some sense, depending on how old you are, it may not be so new. Um, it may be rather old, but at least for me, the last 40 years is looking increasingly new, and um, um, that will be the focus of my talk, and in particular on the various forms of international dispute resolution, sometimes characterized as public, sometimes characterized as private, that have emerged during those 40 years. I think it is, um, particularly appropriate, though, that I'm giving this talk here in Geneva. Because, as we all know, Geneva has been at the forefront for um, the last century, and indeed the last 40 years, um, in many of the developments in international dispute resolution, the, going back some ways in history, 
Geneva was um, the seat of the famous Alabama arbitration, and for those of you who haven't, who haven't gone down to the Hotel de Ville, you must do so and see the room um, where those hearings were conducted. It is a rather different room to this room. Um, and I have to say, as I, one always tries to put oneself in the physical setting where one will talk on an important occasion such as this, and for some odd reason, I'd placed myself in that room. Um, you can imagine that um, moving from 18th century splendor to, I think, 22nd century Starship Enterprise is a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a change, but um, hopefully, hopefully one where the technology will enable me to reach more people rather than, than fewer people. Um, Geneva wasn't important, though, just as the seat of the Alabama arbitration, which in some ways ushered in um, the modern um, era of international dispute resolution, dispute resolution involving disputes between states, um, but also subsequently in the, in the 1920s, the, the draft Geneva Protocol on Pacific Settlement of International Disputes and the subsequent General Act um, um, had their seat, so to speak, here in Geneva and, and um, more ambitiously than the Alabama arbitration aimed at creating a framework for resolving international disputes, not through force, not through sheer power, not through coercion, but instead through an application, a reasoned application of law, legal principles, um, in a predictable and objective and neutral way to facts, facts determined by adjudicators, presented by the parties and, and resolved by, by those adjudicators. And, because my talk is about exactly that, about the generation of international adjudication that followed the Alabama arbitration and those acts, Geneva is an especially appropriate place for me to address you. It's also especially appropriate for me to address you on those topics at the Lalive Lecture in the honor of, of the late professor because his career his life as much as anybody in the world's epitomized exactly that, epitomized the aspirations and the creativity of international adjudication. His career spanned both private international law, he addressed issues of course in, in Swiss courts, mostly international issues, but issues in what in some sense are domestic courts, as well as in international commercial arbitration, as well as international investment arbitration. As, as we all know, he was counsel in the first ICSID case um, and then on the tribunal in the first ICSID annulment proceeding and in public international law matters as well. And so a talk such as mine that aims to look at and to draw together um, the lessons from international adjudication over the last 40 years, I think, couldn't find a better home than in Geneva at the Lalive Lecture, and for that, I thank you again um, for the opportunity to present this. Um, I'm going to start, um, and this is a roadmap for, for where we're going. I'm going to start by describing the proliferation over the last 40 years or so of what are referred to as international tribunals, and as we'll see, that refers to international courts arbitral tribunals and other bodies, all of which adjudicate disputes in the fashion that I've described. With that background um, and, and a couple observations about the importance of that background, I'm going to look at what I call the conventional wisdom about international adjudication, about that proliferation of international tribunals. And as we'll see, it's indeed a, an extensive and, and robust commentary, extensive and robust set of views from scholars all over the world about this proliferation in international tribunals. Um, and in particular, I want to look at how much of that debate, much of the conventional wisdom, has started from shared premises, shared premises about the limitations of, of international courts and international tribunals, in particular their lack of 
mandatory jurisdiction, what's seen as their lack of mandatory jurisdiction, and their incapability, their incapacity of rendering enforceable decisions in contrast to national courts. <clears throat> and I also want to look, um, as we talk about the conventional wisdom, at the very different conclusions that different schools of thought draw from that shared starting point, that shared premise. Despite starting from the same place, we'll see how international scholars reach diametrically opposed positions about both the success of international adjudication over the past 40 years or so, the efficacy of, of that form of, of international law, in a sense, and also very different prescriptions for how international adjudication ought to proceed in the future. With that starting point, with that um, um, beginning from the conventional wisdom about international adjudication, I want to move on and examine the conventional wisdom and do so by focusing on and this is a sense, in a sense, simplistic, because nothing's ever quite so easily categorized, but focusing on what, what I've tried to categorize into two generations of, of international adjudication. One generation going back to 1899, or if one, one wants to be entirely comprehensive, perhaps back to the Alabama arbitration, and continuing through the, the late 1950s, early, early 1960s. And the second generation, the one that really excites me, um, uh, starting in the 1960s and continuing through right now. And after I do that, after I sketch, and that will in many ways be the, the main part of my talk, um, I'm going to look at the implications of the second generation tribunals for international adjudication, and in particular for the conventional wisdom um, that, that I will have described for you um, with regard to international adjudication. Um, but starting first with, with this proliferation of, of international courts and tribunals, um, I think most international law scholars of, of whatever ilk um, agree that there has been an extraordinary growth in the number and variety um, and characteristics of um, international tribunals. Um, this quote, um, from one commentator on, on the current slide, I think captures that, that sense. Um, perhaps a little rhetorically, but I still think fundamentally correctly, um, Professor Romano has explained to us that when scholars look back to the end of the, the 20th century, they'll refer to the expansion and transformation of the international judiciary as the single most important development of the, the post-war age. I think only a lawyer could have, have written that, but at least insofar as law is concerned, um, that, may very well, um, that may very well be right. Um, and, and we'll try to um, prove that by looking at um, the evidence of the proliferation of, of national courts. Um, I could choose lots of um, ways to present this, but because my time is limited, I'll go to what someone else has done. This is the, the project on international courts and tribunals, a joint venture by the NYU Law School and University College London, um, and picked the project on international courts and tribunals, has done, and I'll jump ahead for just one second, a very systematic, and I'll jump back because that's a little hard to digest, um, a very systematic exploration of all the international courts and tribunals that there are. Mm. Um, and has come up with a non-exclusive um, listing of, of 90 or so um, judicial bodies, arbitral institutions, and other what I'd call quasi-adjudicatory um, bodies. Um, this includes courts proper, that means standing courts with standing panels of judges like the Permanent Court of International Justice, the PCIJ, the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, ITLOS, um, the European Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and, and, and. Um, 
those you can see up in the upper left corner there. I won't expect you to read it, and you won't be tested. Um, there are, though, in the rest of that diagram, not quite countless, but, but dozens and dozens of international tribunals, um, tribunals sitting under the auspices of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, NAFTA tribunals in North American Free Trade Agreement, ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Dispute, arbitral tribunals, UNCITRAL, other commercial arbitral tribunals, claims settlement tribunals such as the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, the United Nations Compensation Commission, and more. And you can see those again um, on, on this slide. Um, and, and it includes, in addition to those that I've mentioned, the WTO, the World Trade Organization's various dispute resolution mechanisms. And it makes sense to include all of these various types of, of tribunals, decision makers, in the same perspective because they all do in many ways the same thing. They are all adjudicative bodies who, as I started out my lecture by saying, take facts, find facts, and apply the law to those facts almost always in a reasoned way, allowing the parties an opportunity to be heard. They don't exercise raw economic, political, military, or other power. They have to reason. They have to adjudicate. And they all share that common characteristic. And you can test that um, conclusion, that observation, by looking at how disputes that could be submitted to almost any one of these bodies can be submitted to many of the other bodies just as well. A dispute that you could submit to an international commercial arbitral tribunal can in many cases, in many cases is, also submitted to a bilateral investment treaty, a bit arbitral tribunal. It can also be the subject of national court proceedings. And it can be the subject, depending on who the parties are, of an ICJ proceeding um, or other proceedings in an international court properly described. And so what I want to do is look at how all of these various um, international tribunals of very different characteristics have functioned over the last hundred years. And I want to do it, as I said initially, um, by looking at the conventional wisdom about this entire range of international tribunals. Now, there is a very extensive and, and um, vigorous debate on this topic. You have professors as varied as Professor Goldsmith, who, who we heard about, about previously, um, together with um, Eric Posner, John Yu, um, and others who are quite skeptical about these developments in international adjudication and international law. And you can see one example. We're going to look at some more of that, that skepticism um, on, on the current slide. Um, there's another, though, um, extremely um, vigorous body of proponents, if you will, of, of international adjudication. They're reflected not only by, by some of us in this room, but Anne-Marie Slaughter, um, Larry Helfer at Duke, Andrew Gutzman at, at Berkeley, Ken Abbott, and others who, who, although sharing some of the same premises about international adjudication, um, reach a very different view um, about um, both the efficacy of, of international adjudication and also prescriptions about how in the future international adjudication um, should be structured, what forms it should take. But before we, before we go to the differences, um, let's talk about the similarities, the shared premise. Um, and the shared premise, interestingly, that, that both the, what I can call the skeptics on the one hand and the proponents on the other hand of, of international adjudication um, agree upon um, is, is essentially twofold. Um, it, it starts with the observation that all these, um, all these international tribunals are, are quite different from, from national courts of the sort you and I, you and I um, are 
I don't think I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah, but if I am, I stopped. Um, um, it starts with the observation that um, international tribunals are, are quite different from normal domestic courts, and that the two main differences, there, there are a number, but the two main differences are that unlike national courts, international tribunals lack mandatory jurisdiction. They only have the jurisdiction that states choose to give them, and states don't have to give them any jurisdiction, and oftentimes they don't. And then secondarily, um, that although international courts, international tribunals can make decisions when parties um, give them jurisdiction to decide something, their decisions are not enforceable. Um, they're not like national court judgments, which you can take down to the bailiff or the sheriff or what have you and have coercively enforced. I mean, one example of this from the skeptical school, you can see on the current, on the current slide, um, Professor Posner, who describes that however impressive all this proliferation of international courts and tribunals may look, um, however impressive the project on international courts and tribunals may look on a slide, it lacks the essential feature of adjudication within states in particular, there's the absence of mandatory jurisdiction. And then from a very different perspective as, as we're going to see in a moment, I'm exactly the same starting point. Um, international tribunals lack a direct coercion mechanism to compel appearance. You can't make Iran or the United States show up in the ICJ. And coupled with this lack of mandatory jurisdiction, which is to be contrasted with domestic courts, international courts and international tribunals lack the authority, lack the power to issue enforceable decisions. And again, you can see this time from the skeptical school again, Professor Posner, international courts may be able to issue judgments, but they have no means to enforce them. States may voluntarily comply with judgments, and sometimes they do, but they need not. Um, and that puts it, frankly, very bluntly, but um, to some extent um, um, accurately, um, when one considers at least some forms of international tribunals. Um, and again, from the, the proponents of international adjudication, the same starting point, um, no coercion mechanisms to compel compliance with judgments. Um, and Professor Gutzman here, and this is this sort of, um, I think, sums up the, the conventional wisdom in a way. Um, Professor Gutzman explains how um, um, if a state doesn't comply with um, an international decision against it, its assets will not be seized, nobody will be arrested, and the state will not even lose its ability to file complaints. In his view, and to some extent this is, this is shared by both the skeptics and the proponents, what international decisions do, what the decisions of these international courts and tribunals do is provide information. That's the the language, that's the substance of, of both the skeptics and the proponents about the, the um, efficacy of international adjudication. And, and they, uh, particularly on the side of the proponents, providing information is not an unimportant thing. By providing information to states, um, decision makers, international adjudicators, courts, serve what to the proponents is a highly important function. When there is neutral adjudication that looks in detail at a particular dispute, identifies what the applicable legal principles are, determines what the relevant facts are, and reaches a conclusion about the party's respective rights and liabilities, even if that's not enforceable, that's very important because it provides the basis for subsequent actions by the state, and in particular what I would call the exercise of the three R's. Reciprocity, 
reputational concerns, and retaliation. In particular, when an international tribunal determines that state A violated obligations to state B or to someone else, then those determinations provide a basis which if state A acts inconsistently with that judgment, result in damage to its reputation, permit the exercise of reciprocal acts by state B, or the world being what it is, the exercise of retaliation, and, and this is where the skeptics and the, um, the, skeptics and the um, proponents part company, the three R's are actually highly important that public international law decisions by the ICJ or by ITLOS or whoever actually have substantial importance in world affairs, have substantial effects on the conduct of states. And that those, um, those mechanisms, although indirect, are nonetheless important. The skeptics, on the other hand, take a very different view of the world. The three R's for them are things that you should have forgotten about in kindergarten. Um, you might have learned them there, but they really are not of much importance going forward. States will, at the end of the day, do what they do. Um, they'll be guided solely by rather narrow conceptions of state interest and um, somewhat ethereal, somewhat attenuated notions of reciprocity and retaliation really don't have much influence on their conduct. Um, and so there's a, there's a fundamentally different view um, about the importance of international adjudication. You can see um, the skeptics' view here um, on the, in the top bullet point, um, international adjudication notwithstanding all of these, these um, tribunals that I've described for you, um, is ultimately marginal to world affairs. Um, Professor Romano would be heartbroken. Um, and equally, this observation is important prescriptively for what ought to happen in the future. According to the skeptics, international courts should therefore be weak. They should have voluntary jurisdiction, limited jurisdiction, weak remedies. Um, it's entirely appropriate that their decisions are not enforceable. Um, because if all they're doing is providing information, they ought to do it rather like um, the information desk at an airport. Um, if somebody wants to go and get some advice, that's a good thing, but if states choose not to do that, nobody should try to get them to do anything else. On the other hand, um, the, the proponents of, of international adjudication um, take a very different view, despite starting from the same place, the same shared premises. Um, professors Slaughter and, and Helfer and, and, and others um, emphasize the proliferation of these tribunals, suggest that states must know what they're doing, um, suggest that states are actually sending more and more disputes to all these tribunals. And if states are doing that, presumably in their self-interest, it must be working. Um, and generally take an extremely optimistic and positive view about international adjudication. Um, prescriptively, in the, in the second bullet point in the slide, they suggest that um, international tribunals should really be more like national courts, and when you dig into, I don't have time really to do it, but when you dig into their prescriptions, more like domestic appellate courts, meaning standing bodies of fairly substantial numbers of people, a dozen, 15 judges, um, mandatory jurisdiction, um, and the like, um, aspiring towards, um, given where they come from, probably the US Supreme Court, or perhaps the European Court of Justice, um, but that is their prescription in some diametric opposition to the prescription that we've seen from, from professors um, um, Posner and, and you. Um, now what I want to do, and this is really the main object of my talk, is to look at this conventional wisdom. Look at how people have thought about, look at how these professors have thought about international adjudication and consider whether it's right or it's wrong. And not surprisingly, I'm not going to come here and tell you it's right. Um, I'm going to come and tell you that it's wrong, otherwise my talk wouldn't be very interesting. Um, eh, it may not be interesting anyway, but um, at, at least by saying they're wrong, I can be provocative. And, um, and essentially, my thesis is that their description of international adjudication 
focuses on only part of the world, and indeed an older part of the world, not a newer part of the world. And that when you look at the entire spectrum of international adjudication, including the entire spectrum that we saw on the, the slide a few moments ago, one reaches a much more complicated and a much more interesting um, set of, of conclusions. One sees that there are indeed what I've called a first generation of international tribunals um, who um, behave, who have characteristics that are consistent with the conventional wisdom. They issue decisions which are unenforceable. They have broad, potentially broad, aspirationally broad jurisdiction, but it's not mandatory. They only have the jurisdiction that states um, give to them in particular cases, and as we'll see, states haven't given them a whole lot of that sort of broad jurisdiction. And in terms of their more specific characteristics, we'll see how those first generation tribunals are characterized by some of the attributes that we saw of, of domestic appellate courts, standing judicial panels, one size fits all procedural rules. Often these, these first generation tribunals have multi, indeed always I think, have, have multilateral origins and we'll look at that um, in, a, in a moment. And in general this was, as I previously said, a generation that emerged between 1899 and the 1960s. There's some, some more recent additions, but, but in broad, somewhat simplistic terms, chronologically, the first generation um, started at the beginning of the, the 19th century and, and continued through the, the 1960s, um, beginning of the 20th century, excuse me. Um, and in contrast to that, I want to look then at, at what I've called the second generation of, of international tribunals who behave very differently, have very different characteristics as compared to the, to the first generation. These, as we're going to see, um, these tribunals can issue and do issue enforceable decisions, and they have limited, indeed quite limited, but effectively mandatory jurisdiction for reasons we're going to see. And in terms of their characteristics, they aren't constructed like domestic appellate courts, rather, they're, as you can see on the slide, selected by the parties on a case-by-case -case basis, one tribunal for one case, modeled in many ways on international commercial arbitration tribunals going back centuries in, in history. And for the most part, these um, second-generation tribunals don't arise out of multilateral instruments, but instead have more pragmatic origins, usually in bilateral um, or commercial and investment settings. Um, and what I want to do um, is, is run through fairly quickly, um, because my time is limited, the, the first generation tribunals and then turn to the second generation tribunals with whom I'll spend a little bit more time. Each one of these um, descriptions is, with apologies to those of you who've, who've done monographs on, on various of these, necessarily summary and I will leave out multiple important details, but for present purposes, I think it's enough to focus on, on the big picture. Now, not on this slide is the Permanent Court of Arbitration, um, created by first the 1899 and then the 1907 um, Hague Conference on um, International Law, um, ultimately creating the Hague Convention on the Pacific Settlement of, of International Disputes. Um, the aspiration at the time of the Hague Conferences was um, very high, extraordinarily ambitious. What was aimed at was the creation of an international court, a permanent international court that would resolve all disputes, territorial disputes, all legal disputes, territorial disputes, commercial disputes, um, um, any type of dispute arising in the interactions between states, between those parties that, that acceded to, to the convention. Ultimately, those aspirations, which had their origins in, in the, the sort of peace movements of the, the late 19th century, foundered on real-world politics. And what, instead of a 
standing court with mandatory jurisdiction over a large range of disputes between sovereign states, instead of getting that, what was agreed was the PCA, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which critics, and trust me, I, I think the PCA today is wonderful, but what critics have said was neither permanent nor a court nor having anything to do with arbitration. It wasn't permanent because um, it had a rotating list of names of people who could be chosen as arbitrators. Um, it wasn't a court because it wasn't a court. It didn't have jurisdiction to decide anything. It was a vestigial form um, or a, a primitive form of, of arbitral institution with, compared to today's arbitral institutions, very limited um, authority and a very skeletal set of procedural rules. And it wasn't really quite yet arbitration because um, member states to the Hague Convention didn't commit themselves to um, arbitrate anything. This um, PCA would only um, be effective um, once states in the future agreed to arbitrate particular disputes. And if they did that, then the PCA would have a function as an arbitral authority. As it happened, states didn't, in fact, agree for a very long time to have the PCA do very much. In the years between 1900 and, and 1970, there were 25 PCA arbitrations for an annual caseload of about 0 0.3 um, per year. Um, Article 18 of, of the Hague Conventions um, required states to, um, um, didn't require states actually to do anything. It said that by agreeing to arbitrate, which states had to do in the future, states would express their engagement to submit loyally to an award. Um, a kind of backhanded way of saying that the award would be binding. Importantly, there was nothing in the, the Hague Conventions that did anything more to make an award enforceable as opposed to binding. And in a number of instances, the few PCA arbitral awards that were rendered were in fact ignored. Um, the PCA in some ways though is a template for the first and the second um, generations of, of adjudication that I want to look at because that initial history, the, the aspirations for broad um, mandatory jurisdiction to resolve all disputes between states, foundering upon the realities of state politics, um, I think sets the stage for the, the first generation of international adjudication. And then importantly, what happened to the PCA in the 1990s and, and this century thus far um, sets the stage for the second generation. Um, this slide takes us to the next step in the first generation, a step which we're familiar with from, from the Graduate Institute's um, lectures on international law. The Permanent Court of International Justice, the main judicial organ of the League of Nations, um, the statute of the PCIJ, um, um, contemplated the establishment of a permanent court to resolve, as had been intended under the Hague Conventions, disputes between states. The aspiration was, as with the Hague Conventions, um, for broad mandatory jurisdiction. Um, that aspiration foundered again. The statute of the PCIJ in Article 36 didn't provide for, for mandatory jurisdiction. Um, it instead provided for jurisdiction over those disputes that states would submit to the PCIJ, as well as the possibility for a kind of optional clause jurisdiction um, which, in fact, a number of states at the time, about 65% of all the, the, the signatories to the, to the statute of the PCIJ, accepted. Um, um, but, but um, and as we'll see, that's somewhat in contrast to the ICJ, but still, um, in particular in practice, uh, limited success on the jurisdictional front in terms of mandatory jurisdiction. Um, with respect to the decisions by, PCI, by the PCIJ itself, the Article 60 of the statute provided that, that those judgments would be final and without appeal, but there was no enforcement mechanism, um, consistent with, if you will, the conventional wisdom. There was a standing court, 15 members, um, along the lines of the prescription of, of our proponents of, of international adjudication. Um, Importantly, though, 
um, the experience with the PCIJ was, was n not a resounding success. Um, as you can see, um, in the 20 years or so between 1922 and, and 1939, before um, the court fell into disuse um, for obvious reasons, it decided 38 cases. Those are contentious cases. It also decided another 28 advisory opinions for a grand total, depending on how you want to count, of either two or, or 3.5 cases a year. Um, we all know as well that the PCIJ was succeeded by the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, which in many ways um, replicated the template that, that we've just seen. Um, with respect to, to mandatory jurisdiction, Articles 35 and, and 36 set that out. Um, again, no automatic grant under the ICJ statute of, of jurisdiction, as had been the aspiration both in the 1940s and previously in the Hague Conventions, but instead disputes that states agreed to submit to the ICJ. Again, an optional clause, Article 36, subparagraph 2, which provided that states could agree to accept the court's jurisdiction against other states that did the same. Um, initially, as with the PCIJ, that, was, that had some popularity. 60 states in the 1950s had had optional clause um, acceptances under Article 36. That number, though, by, by today has, has fallen to, to, to 30%. And similarly, the usage of the court between 1945 and, and the present, I should update this but haven't, um, was um, about two cases a year, slightly less than with the, the PCIJ. Um, with respect to the decisions that were rendered by the court, um, um, inconsistent experience at best in a substantial number, substantial perhaps over states, in an important number of cases, um, states refused to comply with the ICJ's judgments, um, states from, from all over the world, North America included. Um, um, and the ICJ statute, the UN Charter, didn't do anything to prevent that. Although, as with PCI, with PCIJ judgments, um, ICJ judgments were final and without appeal, there was no real enforcement mechanism. There's a mechanism by which you can go to the Security Council, but that's never been done, at least never clearly done, for, again, reasons that are, that are obvious. Um, another first-generation tribunal, this falls a little bit outside of um, um, the chronological order, um, but the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea um, intended to be the main judicial body, if you will, under UNCLOS. Um, in terms of the enforceability of, of um, international tribunal judgments, they're final, but there's no general enforcement mechanism. There's also no mandatory jurisdiction. States have to decide under Article 287 whether they want to accept ITLO's jurisdiction. And in fact, only 27 states out of 161 contracting states have, have done that. Structure of the court, quite similar to the PCIJ and ICJ, a standing court of a large number of, of members. And with respect to um, um, case experience, again, a very limited um, caseload with some questions about compliance. Okay, that is the first generation. The second gen, and one could round out, I don't have time, one could round out the first generation by talking about uh, regional tribunals. One could talk about um, how regional tribunals, for example, the African Court of Justice and, and Human Rights or the Central American Court of Justice and the like um, um, bear very similar characteristics in multiple respects to that story. Um, the one exceptional exception is the European Court of Justice, which we could talk about separately, that we may have questions about that, but which I think is best regarded, in fact, um, as an example of a quasi-national um, institution as opposed to um, an institution that provides a good model um, for, for what we are talking about here. Um, what I want to do, though, is turn to 
the second generation tribunals, the tribunals that don't support and instead contradict um, the conventional wisdom. And in particular, I want to look at, at five different um, types of tribunals. Um, and just very quickly, by way of, of introduction, litigation against foreign states in national courts, especially since the 1970s, international commercial arbitration involving foreign states, again, the focus is on foreign states, investor state arbitration, whether under BITS, bilateral investment treaties, or the ICSID convention, or other multilateral investment instruments, claim settlement tribunals, and then, then the WTO. And the, the essential um, takeaway from, from these, the conclusion that I, that I will suggest to you is that um, these second generation tribunals exhibit characteristics that contradict the, the conventional wisdom and that um, far from rendering unenforceable decisions, all of these tribunals can render enforceable decisions, decisions that are recognized to be enforceable and that when it comes to it, can be enforced. And that equally, <laughs> if less clearly, um, equally, if less clearly, these tribunals exercise effectively mandatory jurisdiction. They do so in a complicated way, um, but they do so in a way that is inconsistent with the conventional wisdom. Um, let's though look through um, each of these. Um, and this may be in some ways a surprising place to start if we're talking about international tribunals because this is an example of, of national courts. But it's national courts doing things in an international way and also doing things um, consistent with changing conceptions of international law and doing things, if not uniformly, um, then at least consistently. Um, we're familiar, of course, with the, the doctrine of, of absolute immunity, which prevailed during um, a good chunk of the, the 20th century and then um, gave way um, gradually but, but progressively to the restrictive theory of, of state immunity, of sovereign immunity, um, reaching in the 1970s, um, um, I think its, its current form, perhaps not exactly its current form, but with a series of, of enactments um, in, in North America, then, then here in Europe, and, and successively in, in Asia, Japan, Singapore, elsewhere, um, followed by the UN um, Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property. No um, exact uniformity, as I say, but the basic, um, the basic principles behind this legislation and that convention were that litigation based on foreign states' commercial activities, as well as a limited number of other supposedly non-sovereign activities, disputes involving real estate, non-commercial torts, um, expropriation in some cases, um, waiver, um, could all be heard in national courts. Um, the historic rule, either that states were absolutely immune on the one hand, or that the liability of states was a matter for political negotiation with um, a private party's home state espousing the claim in a diplomatic negotiation that involved a mix of blandishments and, and naked threats um, to produce results that were often disconnected from the merits of, of the party's claim um, was history, and that what instead was happening was that all of those disputes previously resolved through the exercise of political power um, in diplomatic negotiations were moved out of that arena and into the courthouse, were moved under state immunity legislation into national courts. That has produced a very substantial body of dispute resolution involving foreign states. Sometimes those exact same issues that could be submitted um, to international commercial arbitral tribunals, to bilateral investment treaties, to the ICJ, or to elsewhere. Um, that body of cases is, um, it's a little difficult to count because of the vagaries of national court dockets and, and the like, but is at least 250 cases filed a year. 
um, it addresses very significant issues, um, including, if one reads today's Financial Times, issues having to do with the Argentinian bond defaults, where national courts hold a sovereign state in contempt under national law. These are not examples of tribunals that lack mandatory jurisdiction on the one hand, or that are incapable of issuing enforceable judgments on the other hand. National state immunity legislation prescribes mandatory jurisdiction. A state is free not to show up at international litigations of that character, but if it does so, it does so at its peril and suffers in much the same way as a private party, the risk of a default judgment. Execution can follow. It's difficult. It's difficult to execute against a foreign state, but in principle, the possibility of coercively executing against commercial property is a viable option and one that gets pursued in the real world, um, if not every day, at least, oh dear. Help. <laughs> so, um, produces um, important judgments. So, um, and, and, and very important issues in very significant cases get resolved by those types of, and permit me a little poetic license, international tribunals. Tribunals, albeit national courts, applying widely recognized principles of international law. My second example of the new generation of international adjudication is our old friend, international commercial arbitration. Um, foreign states engaging today for the last 40 years in commerce and in investment, not always, but very frequently, conclude commercial arbitration agreements with their foreign counterparties. Um, arbitration clauses, as we all know, are routinely included in those sorts of state contracts, and they, and I won't spend much time on this because I know it's familiar to you, they routinely provide for institutional arbitration, sometimes ad hoc arbitration, tribunals of one or three members chosen by the parties or by an institution chosen by the parties for individual cases. Importantly, these arbitration agreements are given effect through an international framework. Most importantly, the New York Convention to which 150 or so states are now party, guaranteeing the global enforceability of international arbitration agreements and the global portability of international arbitral awards, including arbitration agreements with foreign states and including awards against foreign states. One of the reasons I began with the foreign state immunity um, um, slide and, and sequence is that that foreign state immunity framework gives effect to the arbitral awards and to the arbitration agreements that are concluded by foreign states, making it possible both to enforce those awards as a practical matter and those arbitration agreements. Again, a state doesn't have to show up at an arbitration, but if it doesn't do so, it does that at its risk. It will be treated in much the same way as a private party, meaning a default award capable of enforcement will be rendered against it. In terms of caseloads, and thinking back to our first generation for a moment, there are, and again it's difficult to count, but at least 300 or so international commercial arbitrations filed each year against foreign states or foreign state entities. The ICC's statistics, which break this out better than many, estimate that some 10% of all ICC arbitrations fall into that category. Other institutions may have slightly different proportions and percentages, but what's clear is that there's a very substantial number of international commercial arbitrations heard and decided each year involving foreign states or their companies, and again, those decisions frequently involve highly important issues, not just to the states and, and to, to their, 
the commercial counterparties of the states or the state counterparties to, to the states, but to the public at large. They consider issues of, of public international law. They consider issues of, of corruption. They consider issues of national regulatory policy and national public policy, picking up on things that Professor Lalive taught to us, to us all. Um, and the awards that, that are rendered by those tribunals considering those issues enjoy a high degree of both formal and practical enforceability. Foreign states can run, but often they can't effectively hide. Um, and at the end of the day, voluntary compliance, um, um, at least in some fashion, um, occurs frequently. Um, my next category of, of um, second generation tribunals is international investment arbitration. And again, it follows much the same um, pattern as, as commercial arbitration, in part because it was, it was modeled on it. In investment contracts between foreign investors and host states, arbitration clauses are, are common. The ICSID Convention um, from the 1960s um, gave, as the New York Convention did for commercial arbitration agreements, a legal framework and mechanism for enforcement for those arbitration clauses in, in investment contracts. Um, and indeed, in Article 54, imposed obligations just as Articles 4 and 5 of the New York Convention did for commercial arbitral awards, imposed obligations on all of the 150 so or so contracting states to recognize and enforce those ICSID awards. Um, in addition to the ICSID convention, though, as we also uh, are well familiar, bilateral investment treaties, some by current count 3,000 um, bits, um, have been entered into um, by, by today. The number grows. Um, um, with each passing, passing year, um, providing um, in the, the memorable, if inaccurate, words of one, one scholar for arbitration without privity. Even if the foreign investor has not included an arbitration clause in its investment contract, it, by virtue of a bilateral investment treaty, has a right, a unilateral right, to commence an arbitration against the host state raising claims under um, the international law protections of the bilateral investment treaty. Um, those um, bilateral investment treaties are joined by multilateral instruments, um, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the Energy Charter Treaty, um, the ASEAN Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, all also provide mechanisms for the um, arbitration of investment disputes. All of that has produced um, some 40 investment arbitrations being commenced each year. Those investment arbitrations, as we know, again from, I could quite literally say, today's Financial Times, um, involve very significant issues as well as very significant amounts. Does $50 billion ring a bell? Um, and the, the legal issues um, that are um, considered by the, these tribunals are in many ways some of the, the most important um, international legal issues of the day. Questions about um, the authority of states to, to regulate um, aspects of, of the environment, of health, health, their economy, and the like are considered by um, um, investment arbitral tribunals every day. And now, um, it, it's also important, indeed very important, to, to recognize that there is substantial debate about um, this, this particular development, and I'm going to come back to that towards, towards the end of my, my, my remarks, um, debate about the, the wisdom, um, the legitimacy of, of investment arbitration criticism of precisely some of, of these aspects. And um, as we come back at the very conclusion of, of my lecture, I'd like to, to look at a couple of, of, of those considerations. Before we do that, and just very quickly, other second generation tribunals, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, um, heard some 4,000 cases um, over its 20-year history, still, still in, in, in work, if not hard work. Um, producing awards that, 
that through the security arrangements um, that were concluded by Iran and the United States, um, had a perfect record of, of enforcement, at least thus far. Um, the United Nations um, Compensation Commission, um, again, um, processed, um, perhaps in, as opposed to hearing, processed some 2.6 million claims for dramatic amounts of, of money um, and rendered awards for, for almost equally dramatic amounts of money, all of which were satisfied. Um, and finally, again, just very briefly, the dispute settlement understanding of the World Trade Organization, the, the WTO, um, most importantly seen in context with the GATT, um, which preceded it. Um, in contrast to the GATT, um, the WTO um, DSU procedures um, became essentially mandatory. If you're a party to the WTO, you have to be a party to the DS, DSU. Um, and it provides for um, mandatory dispute resolution and effectively enforceable decisions, albeit indirectly through, through a mechanism of, of authorized um, countermeasures. There have been 400 some, some cases filed, 25 cases a year. Again, um, high, very high rates of, of compliance ultimately. And as with the other forms of second generation adjudication that I've looked at, a body that decides very important um, issues of, of public international law, of international um, trade law. Um, so with that, um, and I apologize for its whirlwind character, um, that whirlwind um, um, overview of um, the real um, world of, of international adjudication, the second generation of international adjudication, I'd like to go back and look at both the, the premises of, of the skeptics and, and the proponents of, of this form of this body of, of international law. Um, states may voluntarily comply with judgments and sometimes do, but they need not. The assets of the non-compliant state will not be seized. Um, and um, international tribunals um, can't exercise mandatory jurisdiction. Um, they can't do anything to prevent states from ignoring them. Um, the reality, um, of course, um, is very different. The reality is that in very important aspects of international adjudication, um, states um, do have to appear. Um, states have to appear in state immunity proceedings, um, proceedings in national courts under um, state immunity legislation. They have to appear in international commercial arbitrations. They have to appear in investment arbitrations. They have to appear in the WTO. And if they don't, they are exposed to default judgments, um, which can be executed against their assets. And if they do and they lose, they're exposed to those same risks. Now, one can say, well, states don't have to conclude international commercial arbitration or investment arbitration agreements. But the reality there, too, is that they actually do. In order meaningfully to engage in international commerce, international investment. Most states, not all perhaps, but most states do have to conclude international arbitration agreements of one sort or the other, and they have to submit themselves to the rigors of the World Trade Organization. And out of self-interest, they conclude the other forms of um, um, dispute resolution, even between parties like Iran and the United States. Um, subjecting them to enforceable um, judgments. And therefore, um, the conventional wisdom, correct as applied to the first generation of international tribunals, isn't correct with regard to the second generation of international tribunals. Um, and I'd like, um, with that observation, to see what it means in terms of um, uh, two central questions. Um, the first question is to go back and look at the, the skepticism of the skeptics, the views of the skeptics about international adjudication generally, and then I'd like to look at some of the prescriptions um, that both um, proponents and skeptics have, have offered um, and, and consider whether given what we've heard about second generation tribunals, those prescriptions um, are appropriate. Um, with respect to success, um, um, my thesis is, will be, 
um, that indeed second generation tribunals have been um, very successful. Um, they have been one of the most important um, applications, successful applications of, of international law in the last 40 years. Um, like many children, they are a generation, they require care and, and nurturing, um, especially when they're under threat. Um, but thus far, they have exhibited striking successes that we all ought to, to honor and, and to cherish. And secondly, their structure and their design um, contradicts the prescriptions that both skeptics who urge purely dependent tribunals with weak or no remedial authority and no real jurisdiction, or purely independent tribunals like national appellate courts, um, and that instead what second generation tribunals teach us is that one needs a more, a more complex, a richer, a more nuanced vision of how to construct a successful international tribunal. Um, but first, and, and here basically is the, the assessment that we saw previously from the skeptics, international adjudication is marginal um, and the way that you should really design one of these tribunals is to make sure it can't do anything. Um, and I think, and this sums up to some extent what I've said over the last 45 minutes or so, um, it's just not right to say that international adjudication is, is marginal. Um, it may be true if you look first at, at point, uh, point two here, um, depending on how you count, and you can, you can certainly um, use different, different metrics, but um, I think it's pretty tough to get past um, five cases a year for first-generation tribunals. Um, and it's pretty tough to find very impressive levels of compliance um, um, with decisions by those tribunals. It's true, and it's important, that they're explications of international law um, are important um, and, and have played important roles in the development of international law. Um, but I think it's equally important to recognize the, the important limitations um, than, that those tribunals face. And if Professor Posner was only talking about um, if the only part of the world he had to pay attention to was first generation tribunals, there might be a substantial amount of force to his, his observations, but as we've seen, that's only part, and indeed my thesis is a small part, of the world, the world of international adjudication, because when you look at foreign state litigation with 250 cases a year, commercial arbitration with 300, and that's me being conservative, I think it's probably more like 500, investment arbitrations of 40, WTO of 25 and, and the rest, um, you get a very substantial number. And it's not just um, um, a question of, of numbers. Um, numbers are important. They, they suggest how frequently something's being done. Um, but it's also the nature of the disputes that are being resolved by these tribunals. These tribunals are considering, as we saw, some of the most important international law issues before the world community today. Expropriatory conduct, unfair trade practices, all sorts of government regulation, corruption, and the like. They are some of the best examples of international law being applied and obeyed that we have today. Um, the size of the disputes is, is in some cases, um, staggering. And then perhaps most importantly, um, the availability of international commercial arbitration on the one hand and investment arbitration on the other to provide a neutral, efficient, effective means of dispute resolution is central to international trade and investment today. It is the foundation on which world trade depends. Um, it is the oil which makes the wheels of commerce turn and without it we would live in a very different world. And in addition, therefore, to just the numbers, the impact and fundamental importance of the second generation tribunals is something I think that cannot be 
underestimated, that compares exceptionally favorably with the impact of first-generation tribunals, and that disproves Professor Posner's observations about the marginality or irrelevance of international adjudication. Interestingly, for the statistic buffs among you, I did some studies of treaty practice over the last um, 20 years or so to see how frequently states were including first generation and second generation um, dispute resolution provisions in their treaties. Now, my sample here was picked randomly. I took treaties that were filed with the UN Secretariat in the years that you can see. And what I found is that you get basically one treaty a year, <clears throat> one treaty in each of those years. Actually, I fudged because there were only three that chose um, the ICJ or ITLOS. Um, in contrast, more than 50 treaties in each of those years chose one of the forms of second generation dispute resolution that, that I've, that I've um, described. Um, interestingly, um, there were a substantial number of treaties, about 30 a year, um, that did include references to the ICJ. Those treaties didn't provide for dispute resolution by the ICJ, though. What those treaties did was choose the ICJ president as the appointing authority for an international arbitration, um, often in a bit context, but not always. Um, it is a, in my view, striking example of how first-generation institutions aren't given disputes but are in fact given roles to support second generation tribunals. And I promised you at the outset of my discussion to return to the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which as you will recall, experienced 0.3 cases per year um, for much of its history. Um, it's enjoyed a real resurgence in the last 15 or 20 years. It's got a caseload now. This, is, this refers to six cases a year, but if you look at, at the last five years, it's even, it's even um, it's much more robust. Um, it has done so um, by serving as the administering authority in bilateral investment treaty and commercial cases as opposed to first generation cases. Another example of a first generation tribunal being, or institution, being converted into one that is capable of issuing through its tribunals enforceable awards. Um, not surprisingly, um, um, I think that those conclusions also bear on the design of prescriptions for the design of future international tribunals. Um, there are, as we saw, prescriptions that what you really should do is have independent tribunals, um, independent international tribunals, um, that really should act more like courts, and by that it's meant more like um, standing appellate courts in national court systems, um, 12 or 15 um, um, permanent appointees who hear any and all cases that come before them, um, applying a um, one-size-fits-all set of procedural rules. On the other hand, there are, as we've seen, prescriptions for dependent tribunals. Um, and what I, what I would like to suggest, and this really is going to bring me to the, to the end of my comments, um, what I'd like to suggest is that neither um, of those two prescriptions um, is, is, is satisfactory, and that instead um, looking to, perhaps not religiously following, but at least looking to um, the success of second generation tribunals um, is important as one thinks about how to design future tribunals. And in particular, I think it's important to look at how the second generation tribunals that I've discussed combine a blend of both dependent and independent characteristics. Now, the dependent and independent vocabulary, I apologize for, it's, it's the conventional wisdom. Um, or at least the conventional vocabulary. And the basic idea is a dependent tribunal is one that's completely subject to the party's will and, and um, in, in, 
almost entirely weak, almost agents for, for the parties with no independent um, capacity, whereas the independent um, template, if you will, is, as I said previously, modeled on domestic courts. Now, it's interesting because I think when you look at the successful examples of second-generation adjudication that I've described, they combine in very interesting ways both dependency and independency. On the one hand, they have, they have limited jurisdiction, right? I mean, they, are, they, they arise out of a specific contract or a specific um, investment contract. Um, they arise out of um, the generally reasonably narrowly drafted terms of a bilateral, i.e. just between two states, investment i.e. just investments treaty with specified protections. The WTO, I don't have time to talk about it, but has very carefully drafted limitations on, on the authority of WTO tribunals, which contrasts with the aspirations for very broad jurisdiction um, at, at the ICJ, at Los and, and otherwise. Um, and, and in some sense, that is, that is classic dependency. On the other hand, as we've seen, um, there are strong systemic needs for states actually to agree to those sorts of, of jurisdiction. Um, the tribunals are selected in these cases almost always on a case-by-case -case basis with the parties substantially involved with very limited appellate review. I mean, in contrast to, to standing courts, um, again, classic dependency. Um, Fact-finding and, and adjudicatory procedures that are tailored um, to, to individual disputes, um, which, which again are in contrast to your, your model of a, a domestic court. And yet, in contrast to all those evidences of dependency, you have perhaps the most striking example of, of independence. These, these tribunals um, can effectively issue default um, decisions, default awards, that are enforceable against states, whether they like it or not. Um, and I would suggest um, in, in closing that as one thinks about future um, international tribunals, um, these characteristics successfully applied in a wide range of, of um, fields um, at least bear consideration and, and probably a lot more than just consideration as one designs future international tribunals. And uh, if, as a final closing, um, I, do, I do think it's, um, I think it's important to recognize what I alluded to, to previously, which are the, the criticisms of, of one element of second generation international adjudication, and that in particular is, is investment arbitration. Um, uh, critics um, argue that um, for a variety of reasons, BIT tribunals, ICSID tribunals have too much um, authority, um, that the basic construct of um, investment arbitration is tilted against host states, um, and against public public interests. In a sense, that criticism wouldn't be happening if investment arbitration wasn't, contrary to the views of the skeptics, extremely important. It wouldn't be worth spending a lot of energy and rhetoric criticizing something that was marginal or, or irrelevant. Um, at the same time, um, there are legitimate criticisms of any dispute resolution process. Disputes are, are horrible. The world would be much better without disputes. And dispute resolution, particularly for clients, is usually fairly awful too. And it's not exactly a question of, of finding the, the best result, but in most circumstances, finding the procedure that's, that's least bad. Um, and at the same time, um, serious efforts are underway have been taken and remain underway to address the concerns of, of critics of investor state arbitration. Um, that said, those concerns, the criticism should be viewed, must be viewed um, in the context of, I would suggest, the overall success of um, international adjudication, particularly second generation international adjudication. Um, 
as an example of international law, effectively and in action, um, that critics of that form of dispute resolution at bottom criticize international law itself and international adjudication itself. And that, as I said previously, um, any child, um, the child of the second generation, needs care and nurture and support during troubled times. And with that um, call to parentship um, and guardianship, um, I'd like to thank you again for your attention and welcome any questions you might have. It's a really bad sign if nobody asks any questions. I think down here in the front. Thank you very much for your very provocative um, lecture and very interesting one. I'm Marcelo Cohen. I'm professor of international law here at this uh, institute. M my first reaction would be that uh, you made a comparison that it is difficult to be accepted because you compare things that are difficult, difficult, uh, comparable. Uh, take the case of the ICJ, as you well know, uh, only states may appear before the ICJ. How many states do you have? Uh, around 200. If you have the case of uh, foreign investments, how many foreign investors do you have all around the world? And then if you take into consideration this basic element, then all these comparisons between how many cases per year do you have in, in one generation and in the second generation, uh, how many treaties including compromissory clauses accepting the jurisdiction of the ICJ, and how many cases, how many treaties do you have in which uh, uh, arbitration or second generation tribunals are accepted, I think it is very difficult to compare these uh, two situations. On the other hand, uh, I have some doubts ab about uh, calling Eric Posner's comments conventional wisdom. Uh, uh, because if you have a look, indeed, if you have a look at uh, uh, the ICJ practice, uh, you may find that uh, judgments by the ICJ uh, has been have been applied. Uh, if you uh, have a look at states having accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ, you will notice that they finally end up coming to the ICJ uh, if uh, there is a case against them, and so on and so forth. Um, this is my comment. My question is, uh, if you, since you have compared what you call first generation and second generation of tribunals, uh, what about coherence of case law? If you compare first generation and second generation, what is the outcome of this comparison with regard to coherence of case law? Those are, those are excellent comments and, and questions. I certainly didn't mean to um, suggest that one can do um, um, an apple for apple statistical comparison, and I tried to some extent to make fun of my own statistical comparisons. That said, I do think it's important to look at the relative usage over time, whether a particular type of generation or institution is stagnating on the one hand or increasing in usage on the other. Um, I think it's important to look at treaty practice where states are free to include different forms of dispute resolution in their treaties. And um, you're right, there are 150 or 180 states that you could look at, but the treaties filed with the UN Secretariat reflect what they consider to be the most effective choices. Um, more importantly, um, and I did try to emphasize this, I think it is the character of the disputes 
and the importance of the issues decided to fundamentally important aspects of contemporary life, trade, commerce, regulation, um, boundary disputes to some extent. Um, and that that is, um, I think, um, the clearest proof, if you will, of the importance of second generation tribunals vis-a-vis -vis first generation tribunals. I also think, um, although compulsory jurisdiction is sometimes accepted and ICJ judgments are sometimes obeyed with the counterexamples, and in particular, um, the decline from 65% acceptance in the PCIJ to 60% in 1950 and 30% today um, is an important statistic. And the examples of non-compliance with ICJ judgments um, are important warnings um, for, for um, the older generation. Um, with respect to the coherence of of international law. Um, that's obviously an issue that is of um, relevance. Um, whether one accepts my first generation, second generation um, analysis on the one hand, um, um, and even if one looks just at first generation tribunals, um, that debate arises with respect to the ICJ and, and ITLOS and, and the ICC for understandable reasons. And um, I see um, those questions of coherence. How is it do you take the potentially disparate decisions of different tribunals, different bit tribunals, different commercial arbitration tribunals, different international courts, um, as more of a challenge than, than a problem? Um, it's a question of issues of um, um, precedent and um, of the development of international law in its traditional form through multiple voices speaking and out of that consensus or disagreement emerging and people acting on the basis of that. Um, I think the important, um, and, and I do think it's a critically important aspect, um, is that at the end of the day, international law is founded on consent. These tribunals are issuing decisions based on consent, and those decisions play important roles in creating international law. Um, I would suggest more important roles than first-generation tribunals. In the back. Thank you. Jorge Huerta Goldman from Tilpa here in Geneva, Carouche. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I learned a lot from it, especially on the step from first generation to second generation. I'm 41, so I tend to underestimate the importance of that step uh, and give it for granted that the efficiency of the second generation is there. But my, my question is, where would you place investment arbitration? Would you place it closer to commercial arbitration or closer to WTO litigation. I mean, when one reads NAFTA chapter 11, you see that New York Convention has been incorporated as a means for enforcement. Whereas when you see WTO, you have the type of measures is regula regulatory measures. So non-commercial measures can be challenged on the WTO law as well as investment arbitration. But I would like to have your opinion mm. on if you have to put a degree, would you put it closer to commercial arbitration or closer to WTO? Thank you. It's a, I think it's a very interesting question, and um, I think you rightly point out that um, investment arbitration and different sorts of investment arbitration exhibit um, characteristics of both um, a WTO-like regime and, and a New York Convention-like regime. If, to, just to take the easy case first, if you will, if you take a classic bit arbitration that doesn't feed you into ICSID, you end up under pretty purely a New York Convention regime, and therefore it's a lot like, maybe entirely like, international commercial arbitration. If you take a classic ICSID regime that, um, where an investment contract feeds you straight into ICSID, then I think you, you make an interesting point. I didn't have time to discuss it, but one of the interesting aspects of um, many second generation tribunals is that while they combine elements of what's referred to as dependency, 
at the first instance, i.e. the parties pick a tribunal and negotiate the procedures and, and the like for a particular case, they often in some fashion have a more independent second tier, and I hesitate to call it review, it's not really review, but second tier um, um, scrutiny of some sort. It's most obvious in the WTO regime with the appellate body. It's also obvious, although different, in ICSID with annulment panels. Um, it exists, although much differently, in the New York Convention um, context where you have um, recognition and enforcement, albeit subject to very, very strict limitations. Um, I think I personally would place in the pure ICSID regime um, um, the, the dispute resolution a bit closer to the commercial arbitration world, although um, clearly there's a, a parallel of sorts between the appellate body and the, the annulment panels. There are important differences, I know, at least some of you are thinking, um, but there are similarities also. In the middle there. Thank you, Mr. Bourne, for the presentation. I had a question more relating to your uh, personal and professional background. I would assume that the shift from first to second we'll generation... We'll do part of that. I'm sorry? We'll do part of that. <laughs> no, but my question would be, um, the, the shift to the second generation tribunals must have meant something also for the legal profession that surrounded the tribunals, shifting from five to a or three cases a year before these very high courts such as the ICJ to the everyday practice of international law must have meant something. So I, wanted, I would like you to develop a little bit on what it meant for the profession to recognize itself as such. It's interesting because that comment I think in some ways goes back to, to my answer to the, to the first question. Um, I think it was Abe Shays that talked about an invisible college of, of international lawyers, um, scholars, practitioners, because he, like Professor Lalive, was, was both. Um, and, and his vision, one can accept it or not, was that international law was developed and, and given force through this invisible college of lawyers in government, out of government, in academia, out of academia, in council's shoes, in professor's robes, in arbitrator's seats, no pun intended. Um, and that out of, um, out of that college, um, with a focus on, on scholarship, um, international law would, would be developed and that there was a vigorous and healthy interchange between people in, in different roles, academic, um, practitioner, government, otherwise. Um, and I think um, that is a characteristic that one sees in particular in the second generation um, um, tribunals. Um, but to some extent, it shares, it shares some characteristics with the first generation. Um, um, I'm sitting on cases in investment tribunals, and, and many others are, with, with ICJ members. Um, um, council in investment arbitrations, our councils in commercial arbitrations, and in the ICJ, um, and in other forums. Um, and they're also arbitrators. Um, and they also go into and come out of government. Um, and they also teach. Um, one of the characteristics of our world, international adjudication, is that there's um, a un almost unique, maybe unique, attention to, to scholarship, in part because I think of Professor Shays, I mean, I differed with him on, on many things, um, but agreed with him on this because of his, his vision of a college of, of lawyers, international lawyers. And going back to my answer to the, to the first question, it is that college discerning common principles, working out common principles in different settings with the people in different capacities, I think, that provides the coherence of the law. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, nothing is, especially in dispute resolution. But does it work? Um, look at my statistics. Look at the importance of um, the decisions that those tribunals um, make and the importance of what they do to the reason we can all afford these beautiful premises, um, international trade and commerce. <laughs> 
in the front. Thank you, Mr. Bourne. I wanted to pick up on the point you raised at the end of your presentation about the parentship or the parenthood between the generations of tribunals. As you say up there, the success of the second generation tribunals counsels for considering their design for future tribunals. But as you also said, the same success has gen generated a certain criticism in some circles called even a backlash um, against these international tribunals. So looking ahead to the next generation, to what extent do you see that generation being a victim of its predecessor's own successes? And what can they do to guard against that risk? Um, I think that's a very good question. Um, I hadn't, in, indeed it's more prescient than, than I was prepared to go. I was still focused on the second generation and I guess that betrays my age. Um, um, we should indeed think about the, the third generation. I think that the seeds of the third generation um, are found in the second generation, just as its origins were in, in the first. And I think one of the, the, the seeds for the answer is um, the, the process of continual re-examination, you know, recalling Professor Shea's college that that um, is premised on continuing examination, but also continuing revision and responsiveness. Um, there has been that in investor state arbitration and frankly commercial arbitration. One of the interesting things about the rules of, of all leading commercial arbitration institutions is they get revised somewhat to the chagrin of at least older practitioners um, every few years. Um, transparency concerns get considered and debated and Nobody's entirely happy with the resolution, but concerns are addressed. Model bits get revised, sometimes to the chagrin of states, sometimes to the, more often perhaps, to the chagrin of investors, um, attempting to respond to, to criticisms. And I think that's a characteristic of um, the commercial arbitration process out of which my thesis was, these various forms of dispute resolution have emerged. And I think, coming back to your question, it's essential to remain responsive to that. Interestingly, one of the challenges I think that um, one faces is that this is um, an ongoing process of reinvention and rejuvenation um, that occurs not just at the institutional level, um, not just at the treaty level, but also at the level of, of states um, and their arbitration legislation and um, um, equally of, of lawyers, of practitioners, of each one of us. You always need in arbitration not just to take the procedural order you used last time or the last three times, but think about it for this case. And one of the challenges I think that many jurisdictions face is is um, the innovativeness of, of jurisdictions. One thinks of Singapore, but one could think of others who are continually, um, if not on a monthly, it sometimes feels like that, on a yearly basis, improving their legal framework for international dispute resolution. Um, that is a challenge to other jurisdictions, but I think it's also partly an answer to your question. Um, one has to pay attention to, to criticisms. Um, one can't cater to all criticisms, but, but clearly there are improvements that can be made in any system. And um, the, one of the, the, the geniuses of, of international commercial arbitration and investment arbitration is its ability to respond to those. One more question, I'm told, so somebody has to Well, I guess not. Ah, here in the, on this side over here. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question actually so relates to the coherence part of international law and developing international law. Can you speak to the predictability of the prol proliferation of so many dispute settlement fora and whether, you know, where are we going with how we develop international law? Is there even 
a space, space and international law for customer international law. We see more uses becoming customer international law rather than opinion years. So can you speak to that, please? Yes, I and mean, it goes back to some extent to, to some of the answers that, that, that I gave before. Um, and when you look at, um, and in a sense, this isn't a question of first generation versus second generation. When you, when you go back to the, to the slide that, that I started out with um, from, the, from NYU and, and University College London, um, it, you know, it bespeaks incoherence. <laughs> Um, um, if you just look at it, it's hard to imagine um, how, um, how one could have a coherent system of international law emerging from this. Yet, you know, a major chunk of that is first generation. <laughs> Indeed, a majority of that slide is first generation tribunals of various sorts. And therefore, the proliferation of tribunals necessarily poses a threat, whether their judgments are enforceable or not, whether their jurisdiction is mandatory or not, to international law. And um, my, I'm not sure if on short notice I can improve on what I said previously, being that the combination of an invisible college of, of international lawyers on the one hand and developing notions of, of precedent um, which many in this audience, or at least some in this audience, have addressed, um, is important to bringing order out of the necessary disorder that comes from this. Now, one could, of course, imagine more creative solutions. One could create an, um, a supra tribunal that would have a kind of appellate authority um, with regard to all of these different tribunals. I think the implicit lesson of what I've said or, or my, my takeaway on first and second generation tribunals is that that is a very, very difficult thing to imagine, that um, states have been most successful in creating tribunals with narrow focuses for particular problems and particular disputes. Um, they've been willing to grant most authority to those sorts of tribunals. And the idea of imposing um, some sort of supra decision maker on this or on for second generation tribunals is very problematic. There are suggestions, of course, in particular areas um, for mechanisms. Um, and, and who knows, some of these in particular areas, investment arbitration, for example, um, may um, may lead to, to more tangible results. But um, I think for the moment, um, suggest the, the outline that I've provided with respect to precedent and the invisible college of lawyers is the more pragmatic and likely way forward. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid it's about time to wind up, but not before thanking you this highly visible college of international lawyers <laughs> for having joined us this evening. Um, and um, you are all cordially invited to a cocktail upstairs, uh, but I'd like you to join me in thanking once again Gary Ball for having delivered the 2014 Lalib Lecture. Thank you very much.